so having a good scrum master, uh, having a team which is self uh, self sufficient, having a product owner who knows the business and uh, who has the authority, who's not a fake product owner, and creating an environment for the teams to grow and evolve and learn. All these are the building blocks. The foundation is the technical excellence. If you do not have the foundation, whatever you are promising that you will you will churn out features every two weeks. And if you want to do it on a rather longer term, not for two, three, four months only, if you want to do that, technical excellence is the way to go. Otherwise, yes, in the beginning of the product development, you have what, 100 lines of code, 500 lines of code, it is easy to change things in the third sprint, fifth sprint, 10th sprint. But if you continue developing the product for eight, nine, ten months, after 10 months, if you are not doing things in a clean way, things would get messy, your velocity will go down, or whatever, how, however you want to calculate your, your, uh, the amount of the speed with which you, with, with which you develop would go down, and business would get upset. Uh, so the promise that you give, that's why I call it the foundation. Everything else is a building block, this is the foundation. The promise that you make to the business is that you continue doing it over a longer term. Forget about waterfall, will not deliver everything at the end of the 24 months, we will deliver you uh, features every two weeks and we will continue doing it for you for 24 months. This promise would not be fulfilled if you are not uh, if you are not uh, sticking uh, to maturing the engineering practices of your team. Um, and that's where uh, um, I am. Uh, here I, I would also like to, to draw your attention to technical excellence. Uh, Martin, Robert C. Martin, um, in, in one of his talks mentioned that Scrum <coughs> forgot um, the, 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 the land of XP. Scrum is a framework, but train programming, uh, refactoring, test driven development, continuous integration, uh, all these practices are the reasons you are, which empowers you to be able to deliver this. If uh, and he was not picking up on uh, on any of the Scrum Alliance members or organizers, but what he was saying was when uh, Scrum Alliance started doing this one and it, it got a little famous and everybody started taking the CSM courses, the, the Certified Scrum Master courses, uh, what happened was the bulk of the people who were taking these courses were the traditional old project management uh, people. And then they got certified and the old uh, and the old school developers did not uh, were not brought into uh, the bandwagon. And the negative side effect it had was that it in, it started nicely. The idea behind it was nice to bridge the gap between the customer and the developer team, uh, and to delight the customer. But the end result was that because the enough emphasis and enough is the keyword here, enough emphasis was not put on the technical excellence on the practices of XP, and that's why we still see a gap. And and he says this. Gap, uh, Robert C. Martin says, the gap has been evolving and developing within our midst. We've been going to conferences, we've been speaking about all this time. But because the enough emphasis has not been put on technical excellence, that's why we still see Scrum initiatives uh, delighting the customer in the beginning, but then fading off as the time goes by or as the size of the product goes, where it's, and because it was not done with, with clean architecture or, or other technical excellence, it starts becoming uh, a bit messy. Um, another another common uh, thing that uh, is, is is something that we should avoid is artificial feature slicing. The way we slice the stories. Uh, so it is also very common that people say, "Do the persistent part of the story." No, this is an anti-pattern because this does not deliver a user value. And people who come from a from a traditional non-agile background, they the way their minds are, are, are programmed or engineered or tamed during uh, the past few years is that this is what they think, they think database is at the bottom, then you have the middle tier on top of that and then you have a user interface on top of that. So this kind of thinking and, and then when they are about to slice the stories, they slice the stories along those lines as well and those stories when developed independently do not deliver user value. So if you have done the entire persistence layer of some feature and you have finished it within the 10 days of the sprint, this does not deliver user value. And that's why this is also one thing that we should avoid because that would get us to something which uh, uh, about a product which is not potentially shareable. Yeah. Another, another thing is uh, people, some teams tend to forget the non functional requirements. Mm, I, didn't, 
some people do not like the term non functional requirements, but what I am trying to say here is the the high availability part, the, the load of the application, or how would it behave, what would be the response times, are, are we meeting the SLS? So this is also something, um, and uh, I do not remember which presenter, but one of the top, one of the first three uh, presenters just this morning also mentioned that how many times it has happened that we develop features and then we launch on the production and boom, it doesn't work on the production. Uh, maybe because uh, there is another, there is too much load, it doesn't perform well under that load. Uh, uh, another recommendation uh, from my side would be uh, doing, doing behavior driven development or as we call it acceptance test driven development or executable specification. Um, uh, remember one of the Agile manifestos says uh, uh, working software over comprehensive documentation but that doesn't mean that we do not need to do documentation, we need to do necessary documentation. But then people say what about the people who come from the Mercury and HP tools background and says, okay, what is happening with you? Are you guys not doing any or testing or anything? Uh, and, and usually the response, the, the, the standard industry response to that is instead of uh, writing all those test cases in an Excel sheet and a dumb person going to that Excel sheet saying, write BF2304 in the username and write this, this, this in the password, click login and then seeing if the login is log, the login page is there and if yes clicking saying pass it says this is immoral do not do this one instead do what is called executable specifications automate your acceptance testing and by automating test testing you get two benefits one it never gets out of date it never gets out of date because you're running your executable specification with your build pipeline so anytime uh, one of your acceptance test fails, one of your business behavior driven development uh, behavior uh, test fails, you would not be able to launch. So this, you would never get into a situation where your documentation is saying something else and your actual working software is different than that. Uh, second thing is, you would not have to do the regression and testing. Um, and uh, here, um, I would again quote uh, Robert C. Martin where he said that he was working with a client of his, uh, it was about a travel website, uh, and they had 800,000 uh, manual tests that they had to outsource to a company somewhere east uh, every six uh, weeks and they would pay one million dollar for it and then one day CFO came to that uh, QA manager and said your budget has been 30 to half uh, this is too much money we can't continue spending this much money and, and Robert C. Martin says that the, the QA manager came running to me and says uh, he had this printed, this all these test cases printed in a big pile of pages and he came to me and says tell me which uh, 400,000 of these 800,000 should I not run? Uh, 